thank you, Allison, uh, for that. I've always counted the privilege to be able to sing with my children. I don't want to bring a downer right now, but I realize that my chances to sing with my oldest is, is becoming fewer by the day, and so I appreciate so much her being willing to sing uh, this morning. Well, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. We're going to look at two verses there, verses 52 and 53 this morning. This is the fourth of six uh, miracles that surrounded the death of Jesus. And so far we've looked at the supernatural darkness. We looked at the renting of the temple veil. Last week we looked at the earthquake. And in this message we're going to be looking at the miracle of the graves being opened. Now, this event is only recorded for us here in the Gospel of Matthew. I find that very interesting. I agree with Dr. J. Vernon McGee who said, we wish more had been told. Um, I, 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 not that I doubt that it happened. I mean, I believe it happened exactly the way that Matthew said that it happened. But I just wish that we had more details about it. I wish that we had a, a more of an explanation of the details that we do have. Uh, maybe if Mark and Luke and John would have written about this event, then maybe we would have a clearer picture. But God obviously did not lead them to do that. And so that tells me that we have all that we need to know uh, uh, at this point. And, you know, there are plenty of things in the Bible that fit into that category. And, you know, there's there's... Plenty of things that I wonder about. I wish I had more information about. I mean, I wish that I knew what God was doing before He created the heavens and the earth. You know, we're not, we're not told, you know, those details. I, I, I wish uh, that I knew how eternity works. That's hard for me to even imagine that there being no time. You know, that's just forever and ever and ever. Things have always, God has always been, always will be. That's, that's mind-blowing to me. I, I wish I knew more about heaven. You know, we have some details, we have some descriptions in the Bible of heaven, but I wish I knew more about it. I mean, we're going to get to see it one day, we'll get to take it in, you know, with our own uh, eyes one day, but for now, you know, we only have a few details. I wish I even knew about the, some small things in the Bible, such as, I, I wonder what happened to Joseph, Mary's husband, Jesus' adopted earthly daddy. You know, we're not told in the Bible, you know, what, what happened to him. And so, again, my list could go on and on, and probably you have a list, and it's probably pretty long as well, but, but, but let me tell you what I believe with all my heart. If God would have wanted us to know the answers to all those questions, he'd have told us. Uh, we, we'll have those answers one day. We'll be able to ask the Lord Jesus face to face, and, and probably a lot of those questions that we have, they won't even matter one day. Uh, but we'll know it in the by and by. Uh, so let's not worry about what we don't know about this miracle this morning. Let's just look at what we do know. And I want you to notice, first of all, a statement here of what happened. It's, just, it's a matter-of-fact statement. Matthew says, this is what happened. Let me just write it down for you so you'll know. Look at verses 53 and 50, or 52 and 53 of Matthew 27. It says, and the graves were opened. That's just matter of fact, isn't it? We would go, wow, that's unbelievable. I can't, oh, whoa. And we'd have put an explanation, uh, ex, uh, exclamation point at the end of that sentence, right? We'd have underlined it. We'd have, we'd have put it in bold print. Wow, the graves were open, he says. And the graves were open. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city, which is Jerusalem, and appeared unto many. You know, I've never been to the Holy Land. I've often thought about going. I, I don't think I want to go there right now, all right? Uh, maybe in the millennium I'll, I'll get to visit there. Uh, but I, I've never been, but I, I've read that many of the tombs in and around Jerusalem to this day were nothing but hollowed out sepulchers. Uh, uh, for a rock formation that had been hollowed out and then a, a stone rolled in front of it. Uh, these sepulchers are, were at ground level and still are today or a little bit below ground level sometimes. 
Uh, the earthquake, you remember, that we talked about last week was evidently powerful enough that it broke these rock sepulchers. Uh, at least the doorway of this, this rock that would have been rolled in front, it broke that in two. Now, that's not that big of a deal because any powerful earthquake could have done that. I mean, we've seen that in modern day history where an earthquake will just, I mean, it'll tear stone things, brick things. It doesn't matter. It'll tear it all apart uh, through the shaking. But, but what makes this a miracle is its connection with another miracle. And that miracle was that those that were buried in that sepulcher or those sepulchers rose up. They, 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 they were given life. They came back from the dead. Now, we're going to look at that miracle, by the way, in a couple weeks, two weeks away. But, but there's a lot of questions for me that, that circle around this event. Some questions that I looked at this week, and, and again, there are many more questions than these, but there are three main questions that I had, so I jotted them down. First of all, did the number of graves that were open equal the number of those that were resurrected? All right, were, were there perhaps more graves that opened up that folks were not resurrected from? The second question is, if the resurrection of these people occurred at the same time their graves were open, which, were on, which was on Friday, then what did they do? Where did they stay until Sunday morning? And then the third question is, why did those who were resurrected not make an appearance in the holy city, Jerusalem, until after Jesus' resurrection? Those are questions that inquiring minds want to know, at least mine. And so what I want to do at the first part of the message, I want to look at those three questions. The first question, did the number of graves that were open equal the number of those that were resurrected? Well, the answer to that is, we don't know. That was one of the details that was not given to us in this account. But it makes sense, and a lot of times when you read the Bible, that's the way you have to read it. What makes sense here? What makes common sense? Now, I know God can do things outside of our common sense sometimes. He does supernatural things. But what makes sense here? It makes sense that the number of graves and the number of people who were resurrected would be the same. We absolutely do know for sure that it, th these people were called saints. And in the Bible, when you read that word saints, it is talking about those who were believers. And in this case, it would be Old Testament believers who had put their faith in God. These are the folks that God brought back to life. Now, it would not make any sense, again, we're using common sense here, it would not make any sense for God to open up those graves of those who were unbelievers. Because there is no resurrection for unbelievers. There is only eternal death. There is only eternal damnation. By the way, there is no such thing as the undead. All right? All these places, these, these haunted places, houses, and and boat, you know, haunted boats and haunted graveyards and, you know, and all that stuff. Uh, one, of, one of three things. Number one, it's demonic activity. Number two, it's a hoax. And number three, it could be somebody's vivid imagination. All right? But you will never find some, some, some person that has died that is haunting a place. God doesn't allow souls of the dead to roam the earth. Now, notice the second question. If the resurrection of these people occurred at the same time that these graves were open Friday, then what did they do and where did they stay until Sunday morning? Well, the explanation that makes the most sense is that we're talking about two separate events. And I find it interesting in the King James Version, that's the version I'm reading from. If you've got a King James Version in front of you, you can see it for yourself. The King James Version separates these events with a semicolon. One event was the graves opened up. The second event was the resurrection of the dead. I like what William R. Nicholson said about this. He said, if the rocky doors were opened by the earthquake merely to permit the bodies to come forth, then the earthquake would not have taken place till the moment for their coming forth. But those graves were exposed from Friday until uh, afternoon, uh, Friday afternoon until Sunday morning exposed before thousands of spectators. No attempt at closing them during the intervening Sabbath would have been permitted to be made. 
Does it not seem clear, therefore, that the opening of the graves was meant for an exhibition that it had a testimony to give? Folks, these folks were not playing hide-and-seek inside the sepulchers during those, the, during those days. Their bodies were still dead because they haven't been resurrected yet. So why were these graves open at all? Was this what the writer of Hebrews calls a better resurrection? Was it the resurrection where we get a new incorruptible body? Or was it a resurrection like Lazarus' resurrection, where his body was revived? Well, there's a detail in this story that tells us the answer to that question. The fact that the doors of the sepulchers were removed lets us know that this was a reviving of the body resurrection. You remember when Jesus resurrected Lazarus, and he said, Lazarus, come forth! And Lazarus, a dead man, came out of the grave. You remember that? I mean, he had people talking from miles around. Matter of fact, people would travel there just to see this dead man, what used to be a dead man, walking around, eating and talking to folks. Lazarus became famous because of that. But you remember right before Jesus called out, Lazarus come forth, he had the people to do something. What was it? Roll the stone away. Why did he have these folks to roll the stone away? Because Lazarus did not have his resurrected body. Lazarus had the same body that he had before. And, and he had, there's no way, he could not have walked through that, that, that rock door that was there. Uh, that's not how, I mean, it'd be nice to have that ability sometime, wouldn't it? Just to be able to walk through things. Uh, but, but we don't have that ability. Or somebody might say, but preacher, wasn't the stone rolled away when Jesus was resurrected? Well, yes, it was. But if you go back and you look at the accounts of that and put it in a timeline, you'll see something. God sent an angel down to move that stone, to roll that stone away. But he did not roll that stone away to let Jesus out. Jesus had already risen. You go back and look at it, and you'll see that that's exactly true. He was already risen. So why did the angel roll the stone away? So that Jesus' followers, and you remember the women that came to the tomb, and also uh, Peter and John came to the tomb, so that they could look inside, and anybody, anybody that came along could look inside the tomb, including all the doubters, and say, he's not here. There's no body that's here. So that's why the stone was rolled away. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he had his spiritual body. He didn't need that stone rolled away. He could just go right on through it. And you see that uh, he did that with the disciples and his appearances after the resurrection. He just come into the room. He didn't need a door. You know, he didn't need a window to climb through. He just was in their presence. And by the way, praise the Lord, that's the kind of body that you and I are going to have one day as believers. That's the same kind of body that Jesus had on that day. That leads us to the third question. Why did those who were resurrected not make an appearance in Jerusalem until after Jesus' resurrection? Well, the answer to that question has gotten a lot easier, hasn't it? It wasn't like they were waiting around playing tic-tac-toe on the sepulcher walls. That's not what they were doing. No, the tombs were open on Friday, but the saints were not raised until after Jesus arose on that Sunday morning. Jesus rose, he conquered death, and then the saints were able to conquer death. Look, the risen saints, they, they, they got up. You know, we're not told a whole lot of things here, but they got up, they went into Jerusalem, and what did they do? They gave testimony of the power of Jesus over death and the grave. How could they give testimony over something that hadn't happened yet? All right? So they waited till Sunday. All right? God waited till Sunday to, to resurrect them. So now they've got a story to tell. Now they've got good news to give the folks. Jesus conquered death and the grave. Now we don't know how many were raised. We don't know how long they stayed in Jerusalem. We don't even know what happened to them later on. Evidently, again, those details are not important or we'd have been told those things. So let's look at the significance here of what, what we're talking about. The significance of these tombs being open. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 said, says this, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. Who was it? Adam. And death by sin. In other words, death came into the world. 
Why? Because sin came into the world. And so death was passed upon all men that all have sinned. Death was the consequence of sin entering into the world. For the wages of sin is death. That's the consequence. So when the graves were open, it was a sign that everybody could see. It was a sign that everybody could know that Jesus had conquered sin and death. Jesus claimed victory over sin, death, and the devil. Hebrews 2.14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same. He became flesh and blood just like you and me. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. I love this quote from Henry Morris. He said, The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the crowning proof of Christianity. If the resurrection did not take place, then Christianity is a false religion. If it did take place then Christ is God, and the Christian faith is absolute truth. I think we can all amen to that. Amen? we well, do it then, all right? Amen, all right? Or well, here's the great news for us. Because Jesus conquered sin and death and the devil, through Jesus, you and I are conquerors over sin, death, and the devil. In John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. In John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 19, Jesus said to his disciples, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. In Barclay's daily study Bible, we find this quote, the symbolism of this is that Jesus conquered death. In dying and in rising again, he destroyed the power of the grave. Because of his life, his death, and his resurrection, the tomb has lost its power, and the grave has lost its terror, and death has lost its tragedy. For we are certain that because he lives, we shall live also. I read a story about a preacher named James Gordon Gilkey while living in Portland, Oregon, he was told by his physician that he had an incurable disease. Death could not be avoided. Death could not be delayed. So what did James Gordon Gilkey do? He wrote down what he did. And in his, this is, this is his own, these are his own words. He said, I walked out to my home five miles from the center of the city. There I looked at the river and the mountain which I love. And then as the twilight deepened at the stars glimmering in the sky, then I said to them, I may not see you many times more, but river, I shall be alive when you have ceased running to the sea. He said to the mountain, I shall be alive when you have sunk down into the plains. Stars, I shall be alive when you have fallen in the ultimate disintegration of the universe. Folks, you realize that the Bible tells us that the next event on God's calendar is the rapture? And that can happen at any time. And the Bible says there is coming a day, and I believe it's not long. I believe it can happen today. I believe that with all my heart it can happen today. There's going to come a time when a, the, the trumpet's going to sound. I don't, I don't know. I can't, I, I can't fully explain all that, uh, the trumpet sounding and how it's all going to play out. But I do know this. When the trumpet sounds, the eastern sky is going to split wide open. And when that happens, Jesus is going to come riding in on a cloud. And the Bible says that the dead in Christ shall rise first. I heard a preacher say a long time ago, they got to rise first. They got longer to go, I mean, further to go, right? And so they're going to rise first. And the Bible also says that when they arise, they're going to go up. But then those that are living, those that are in Christ Jesus, will meet them in the air. We're going to meet our loved ones. We're going to meet those that have already gone on before us that knew the Lord Jesus. And Jesus is going to call his church home. We're going to go and meet him in the clouds. And the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is fact. That is, look, that is just as real. That is just as much truth in the Bible than anything else that we read. It is happening. It's happening soon. My, now, my question is this. Do you qualify to be in that number of those who will one day be resurrected. Somebody might say, well, preacher, what are the qualifications? Just one. 
Just one qualification. John 3, 36 tells us, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I ask each and every person here this morning, has there been a time in your life that you trusted the Lord Jesus as your Savior? Has there been a time in your life that you remember, you remember it happening, you were there when it happened, that you asked God to forgive you of your sins? Do you remember a time that you repented of your sins and you gave the Lord Jesus your life? If you don't know, if you don't know for sure, would you consider making today that day? We're going to have an invitation in just a moment. That's your opportunity. Make today the day that you know for sure the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Maybe you have this morning. I hope you have. I, know, I, I hope you know the Lord Jesus. You remember back to that time. You say, that was the day that I got saved. I ask you this question then. Are you as close to the Lord as you need to be? If the Lord would come back today, would you be ready to meet Him? Or would you be ashamed? You know, sometimes we go and we visit the graves of our loved ones, and as we're standing there, we think about how much we miss them. We hang on to the hope that because they were believers and we're believers, that we will one day soon see them again. And by the way, that is not a hope so that we have. That is a sure hope that we have in the Lord Jesus. And just as the saints in our text rose bodily from the grave, the day will come when our loved ones who knew the Lord will rise from the, from the grave. And they will be free from death. And they will be free from disease. And they will be free from all corruption. And you know what? They will never, ever, ever die again. What happened in Jerusalem was just a small sample. That's all it was. It was a small sample of what is coming one day when all of the graves of all of the saints will be opened. And those graves will be empty forever. That's the good news of this miracle right here. Hey, it's just a sample. Let, 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 let me show you. It's like God said, let me, just, let me just show you just a little tidbit, just a little blurb of what's going to happen one day. Are you ready for when that day happens? Would you stand to your feet? With every head bowed, every eye closed. I am so thankful this morning that God so patiently gives us time. So graciously allows us the opportunities to make things right with Him. That's exactly what He's doing here this morning. He has given each and every one of us the opportunity right now to make sure that we're ready. You say, preacher, how do I go about getting ready? Pray in a very simple prayer, meaning it with all your heart. Dear God, I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. I repent of those sins right now. God, if you'll have me, please save me. Please save my soul. I, Lord, I want to be right with you. When the Lord Jesus comes back in the sky, I want to be ready. I want to be in that number. I want to qualify. Maybe you hear this morning and you say, Preacher, if the Lord Jesus would come back before this service was over, I would not be ready. I would not be ready. Preacher, God spoken to my heart today. Would you just pray for me that I would make things right with God before I run out of time? Anybody like that here today? Slip up your hand long enough for me to see it. Nobody's looking around but me. I just want to pray for you. That's all. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not even going to ask you about it this morning. I just want to pray for you. Anybody like that? Preacher, would you pray for me? I wouldn't be ready. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Preacher, I remember a time. I was in a Sunday school class. I was on the altar at the church. I was at home by my bedside. I was at a certain place. I, I remember it. Don't remember everything about it, but I, I remember the day that I asked the Lord Jesus to save me. But I've wandered away from Him. I'm not as close to Him as I should be. I've allowed things to come into my life that shouldn't be there. Preacher, I, I'm just being honest. I would be ashamed today. I, I, would, I, I would not want the Lord Jesus to come back today with my life the way it is right now. Preacher, would you pray for me? that I would make things right with the Lord Jesus 
And I would start heading back in the right direction before he comes back. Anybody like that here today? Would you be honest enough? Say, preacher, would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? Maybe God has spoken to you in some other way this morning, and I encourage you during this invitation, and that's what it is, an invitation to come and talk to God about what He's talking to you about. Whatever it is, He might be speaking to you about a loved one, somebody that's close to you that's not ready to meet the Lord, and you just want to come today and call their name out to God and say, God, do something in their heart. I know many of you who are here this morning, you've been praying for your loved ones. You've been praying for your kids. You've been praying for your grandkids. You've been praying for neighbors. You've been praying for friends. Why not just call their name out again today and say, God, continue to show your mercy. God, do whatever's necessary to reach their heart. I don't want, to, I, I don't want you to come back and they not be ready. Whatever the Lord has spoken to you about, I encourage you to come today. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would have your way in our heart. Lord, help us to respond to the leading of your Spirit. As you are speaking to us, Lord, help us to come today and talk to you about it. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. With every head bowed.